Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Kent Walker. I just wanted to briefly introduce Phil Howard, who's here with us to talk about his, his new book, The Rule of Nobody. Uh, this is a topic that's of lots of concern to people at Google, uh, trying to take a look at government regulations, how they've evolved over the years, even as we try and move forward with a lot of cutting edge technology, uh, ranging from the you know, internet kinds of tools to driverless cars and genetics and everything else. We're keenly aware of the challenges in dealing with uh, existing laws and trying to move those laws forward in a positive way. Just yesterday, we got a ruling from the European Court of Justice interpreting a large body of European law in ways that are somewhat challenging for the, the good function of the internet. So Phil has been working on this topic for years, has written multiple books in the area. Uh, it's, it's an interesting area where there's a confluence of people on the left, people on the right, who are concerned about the way, the state that we found ourselves in almost inadvertently as a result of the growth of, of regulations, many of them well intended, but not working out the way that, that we would all like to. So with that, let me turn it over to Phil. Uh, he's uh, going to be here for the hour, and I think he has a couple of books here as well. So if people are interested, I'd encourage you to uh, have an active Q&A back and forth, even though I won't be able to stay for the whole session. Phil? Great. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Kent, and thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, I had this uh, uh, insight, really a brilliant insight, uh, shared by 98% of Americans uh, that the government wasn't working very well. And so I set out in this book to uh, the rule of nobody to try to um, uh, understand what structure would enable government to work better again. And what I concluded is, uh, is that we're actually at a troubling place in the history of our aging democracy. And what's happened is that we're unable to make choices, even the most obvious choices. The democracy's lost the capacity to choose, make choices, move forward, adapt, uh, and keep going. And I also concluded that the problem is not bad leadership, although leadership has not been great. Um, and nor is the problem mainly polarized politics. I actually think the polarization of politics, which is horrible, in Washington is mainly a symptom of powerlessness rather than the cause of this paralysis that we see that when, when, when people feel that they, they don't have the power to make choices, uh, what's left is to point fingers at each other. And they become ever more strident because they know nothing is going to happen. They can propose the most idiotic uh, uh, ideas with full confidence that, again, nothing, nothing will happen in our democracy. What's happened is that uh, we have a structural problem. Uh, which is that the law has sort of piled up decade after decade, usually for very good reasons, uh, but nobody ever goes back to clean it out or make sure it's working. And so, like sediment in the harbor, it's gotten to the point where people uh, in government can't actually do even what they uh, think they should do. So, just a few stories. Um, a couple of years ago, a tree fell in a creek in Franklin Township, New Jersey. Um, it caused flooding. Uh, the town father sent in a backhoe to pull it out. Uh, then the lawyer uh, for the town said, no, you can't do that because it's a class C1 creek, whatever that is. And um, you were have to get approval to remove any natural obstacle from a class C1 creek. So they had to go start filling out forms. Okay, do I just keep going? Yeah, okay, great. So um, uh, 12 days and over $12,000 in legal fees later, they were able to get permission to do what was obvious and pull the tree out of the creek. Now that's just an, an incident, an anecdote. Anecdotes don't prove anything. Uh, in February, the White House issued a, a five-year report on the 2009 stimulus plan, which as you will recall, involved $800 billion, that's almost $3,000 for every man, woman, and child in America, uh, to uh, stimulate the economy. And the bell cow of this program was to rebuild America's decrepit infrastructure, which really needs rebuilding. We have 100-year-old sewage lines, bridges, uh, one out of nine bridges in danger of falling down. Um, so we had bipartisan support. We spent $800 billion. Five years later, the report. I was curious to see how much of it was spent to rebuild infrastructure. And then buried in the back in a chart was this number. Barely 3% of the $800 billion was spent to rebuild transportation infrastructure. You say, well, how could that be? Why, could, why so little? 
Well, it turned out that the President of the United States, duly elected by a majority of Americans, with bipartisan support for this program, did not have the authority to approve even the most obvious rebuilding projects. We're not talking about roads through virgin forests. We're talking about just fixing up old roads and highways and such. The density of regulation today cannot be overestimated. I tell the story at the beginning of the book of, of the Bayonne Bridge was needed to be either torn down or something happened to it to let post Panamax ships come into Newark Harbor. The roadway was a 70 feet too, uh, too low. Uh, a lifetime government employee had the idea, a brilliant idea, of actually just raising the roadway, this existing 80-year-old bridge. It turned out structurally it could, you could do that. Save $3 billion, use the same foundation, same right-of-way, no environmental impact. Four years later, they got their approval, and then the litigation started over whether there was adequate review in the 5,000-page environmental review statement for a project with no environmental impact. You say, well, how could, what, what could they have studied? Well, the law requires them to send notices to all the Native American tribes that might have once had um, contact with, with this area of, of New Jersey. So they're sending letters to the Shawnee Indians in Nebraska and such and ask if they want to participate in the process. Another requirement was they had to do a study of uh, all historic buildings within a two-mile radius of either side of the bridge, even though, in this case, the project would not touch any buildings. It's just using the same right-of-way, same bridge. And so on and on and on. And that's the way law works today. These requirements just piled up decade after decade. It's not just getting approvals either. The most fundamental choices of democracy, like how we spend our money, uh, is all preset in legal concrete. 60% of federal revenue goes to three very important entitlement programs that, that we can't afford in their current form. They don't even come to Congress for authorization. Um, Andrew Cuomo, when he became governor, New York, like most states, had budgetary problems, uh, discovered that there was a, a juvenile detention facility upstate with no juveniles in it that cost $50 million a year to operate. He had a public <coughs> announcement we are going to save the taxpayers of New York $50 million by closing down this facility. Not so fast. There is a law in New York that says you can't close down a public facility with any union employees without at least one year's notice. <laughs> so we had to spend another $50 million. That's 10,000 taxpayers each paying $5,000 a year in taxes to, to pay for a facility that had served the public good not, not at all. And it's not just government that's paralyzed by this. Society is. Technology companies uh, have not suffered as much from this because you're in a new industry. You're beginning to see it happen in, in, in privacy and lots of other areas, like the ruling yesterday from the, from, from, from the EU. But other, other, the most rudimentary, starting a restaurant, things like, opening a restaurant in New York requires approval from 11 different agencies. In the U.S. today, in recent rankings by the International Monetary Fund, U.S. ranks 20th in the world in ease of starting a business. This is the United States of America, 20th in the world. And it's just because of the secretion of licensing laws, and regulations. The Bayonne Bridge Project I mentioned uh, required 47 permits from 19 different agencies to get permission to raise a roadway of a project that had enormous environmental benefit and, and economic benefit to the region. And finally, this kind of rule-based secretion of law and stuff is changing the culture. A couple of months ago, after the book uh, was in galleys, um, a longtime District of Columbia Parks employee was walking with his daughter. He had a heart attack in front of a fire station uh, in D.C. The firemen were watching, they were standing there, their first responders. She, the daughter ran over and said, my father's gasping for breath. I think he had a heart attack. Can you come help? And they said, no, the proper rule is to call 911. And she said, but, but he's gasping for breath. Said, no, the rule is to call 911. They called 911. They watched. Uh, by the time the ambulance arrived, he was dead. This is not an unusual story. Uh, a couple of years ago in Alameda County here, a mother called... Uh, the fire department, and said her 
son was off his meds, was very depressed, was going to commit suicide, said he was going to commit suicide by going to a certain beach and just swimming out until he, until he drowned. So sure enough, the firemen show up on the beach, and there's this guy treading water 100 yards offshore. And they stand there and watch. And the uh, crowd gathers on the beach and says, why don't you go, go help him? And they say, well, because of budget cuts, we haven't been recertified for land-based rescue. And they watch. So this woman, finally a woman bystander, dives in the water, cold water, goes in, tries to save him, gets there too late, brings in the body. This hit the newspapers. The next day, the fire chief was asked, what would you have done if that was a child drowning? And he said, well, I know what I would do if I was off duty, but if I was on duty, I'd have to follow the rules. So think about this society we built where the President of the United States can't approve the most obvious and needed projects for our society, and so they end up wasting most of the $800 billion to shore up insolvent state debt budgets, basically not rebuilding the infrastructure, which desperately needs to get rebuilt. And you have firemen not saving lives because the rules don't let them do it. So is this, is this how democracy is supposed to work? And I should submit, no. Is that just how the rule of law is supposed to work? I don't think so. Uh, rule of law is supposed to support a free society, not remove our freedom to make sense of things. Uh, in the 1930s, Harry Hopkins, there was a law passed to stimulate the economy the Civilian Works Administration, was passed in November. By the end of December, Harry Hopkins, who ran it, had hired 2.6 million people in less than seven weeks. It's not like this is rocket science. <laughs> people have to be able to, to make choices and take responsibility. But, but we've created this, this world where, in, in essence, at this point, because of the accretion of law, Democracy is basically run by dead people. It's run by whoever wrote all these laws and wrote all these regulations over the years, and they piled up, and now people go to work, and they say, well, what do I have to do? And they go, and their noses in the rule books. And these people who are long gone, we wouldn't know who they were even if you tried to find them, are telling us what to do. And who's responsible? Who's responsible for the fact that the that we couldn't spend the $800 billion to rebuild the infrastructure? Nobody. Who is responsible for the budget deficit? Nobody. Who is responsible for any of these idiocies? Nobody. Nobody's in charge. So we have two structural flaws. Um, one of them relates to, the, to our aging, aging democracy, uh, and which is we don't have the capacity, really, or even the idea, or the capacity, to go back and adjust old laws. It's nowhere part of our public debate. The laws get passed. The people, uh, the legislatures let them set sail towards immortality, treating them like they're the Ten Commandments or something, except it's the Ten Million Commandments at this point. Not understanding that there's a big difference between basic principles of law like um, the reasonable person standard or, or don't commit fraud or things like that and these social programs and regulatory programs were highly complex that affect human behavior. They reflect priorities at the time they were enacted. And all of those things change. And all of them have unintended consequences. There's not one law that's passed that doesn't have unintended consequences. One example, special ed laws were enacted in 1975. Very important. Before we had them, we locked disabled kids up in horrible places like Willowbrook. So we passed this law in a certain way. It evolved, however, over the decades until now special ed consumes over 25% of the total K-12 budget in America. There's virtually no money for gifted children. There's virtually no money for early education. Is that the right balance? No one's even asking the question. So we have no mechanism for going back and adapting old law. It's a formula for failure, just that by itself. Compounding the problem, causing the paralysis, is that we have a deliberate philosophy that humans shouldn't be allowed to make public choices. Believe it or not, that is our philosophy. And it's shared by both the right and the left. 
this the concept of rationalized completeness, that whatever government gets its, hand, its hands on, it should tell people exactly how to do things, not just what to do, not uh, just have a you know, reasonably safe facility or that, and inspectors come by and have discussions and arguments or whatever, but actually telling people exactly what kind of equipment to use, exactly how to do it. Nursing homes, I talk a lot about nursing homes. Uh, nursing homes in most states have typically about 1,000 rules. Food should be stored no less than 15 centimeters above the floor. Hot food should be served not less than 115 degrees. The residents should be an average of 80 square feet. There should be 0.09 recreational workers. Those are the trash cans shall be in the bathroom. Eggs shall be cooked. The level of the granular detail of these rules is absurd. And they don't help. They hurt because people go to work trying to comply with the rules, not trying to make the, the residents' lives better. So how is people say, well, what else could you do? Well, in fact, Australia, a couple of decades ago, had the same problem with nursing homes. They had a 1,000 rules. They got rid of all the rules. They replaced them with 31 principles. Have a home-like setting. Respect the dignity of the residents. All the experts scoffed. They said, these nursing home operators are going to get away with murder. It's horrible. Within a year, the nursing homes were all twice as good. So the experts went and studied. Why is that? Because people actually went to work asking the question, what's the right thing to do? Regulators didn't give up their authority. They could still close down a place if it was abusive or not. And you could still have arguments. And courts could resolve them if you had an argument. But now the argument was over what's right and what's wrong, not the parsing of legal language in a thousand rules. So one of the horrors of modern detailed regulation is it divorces regulation from right and wrong. You know, the, the Constitution was 10 pages long. The Volcker rule uh, implementing one little part of the Dodd-Frank financial regulation law to, to regulate proprietary trading by banks. The Volcker rule is 980 pages long. Do you think they're going to be talking about right and wrong? No. You know, hundreds of lawyers in the banks, hundreds of lawyers, you know, at the Department of the Treasury, and they're going to be arguing over legal parsing of language. No, but doesn't it mean this? Wouldn't in this situation it really be a hedge? The word, you know, what does the word hedge mean? You know, it's just, there is no set of words that avoids ambiguity. And by cre trying to create a legal system that avoids ambiguity because we don't want anybody to make a mistake, what we've done is instead driven people into this uh, world in which everyone acts like idiots of odds. Nobody's talking about what's right and wrong. No one's taking responsibility to do the, rather on the public side or the other side. So, so we have this, this structural problem and I don't think we can repair it. You can't send some brilliant guy like Cass Sunstein into the White House and say, let's have different motivations in this area of the law. It's like going into the Amazon jungle with some shears. I mean, the law at this point, there are over 100 million words of binding federal law and regulation growing, growing every year, over 2 billion words of, uh, if you combine all the state regulation with it, no one knows it all. No one in a school knows all the rules that apply to schools. Uh, so you can't actually go in and, and edit it. You need a new philosophy. And I think the philosophy should be one based on human responsibility and accountability should be generally principles-based for human behavior. You still have speed limits that can be detailed or effluent limits for pollution. But in many areas of government oversight, they should be, um, they should always leave room for judgment, always leave room for the question. So what are the solutions? One solution is to do a spring cleaning. It's happened periodically through history. It's called a recodification. We did it in the 1950s with commercial law. Something called the Uniform Commercial Code was uh, put together by a group of experts to replace this kind of mad, uh, madcap quilt of inconsistent, complicated state contract laws uh, in the 48 states at the time. And it was the foundation for the post-war economic boom. Everybody knew where they stood with contract law. The set of principles that people could study, could be interpreted by courts, it was like replacing a muddy road with a paved highway. If you go in 
and recodify law that's built up over the ages, it always has that effect. It had that effect in Germany at the end of the 19th century. It had that effect when Napoleon recodified the law and created the Napoleonic Code, which is now the basis for half the world, civilized world's law. Fantastic achievement. In the early 19th century, it happened in ancient times with Justinian. We can't fix this problem without doing that. Uh, and, and the second thing we have to do is we have to radically simplify in doing that the law and then turn it, and then understand that law is supposed to be a corral. That it sets goals, principles, sometimes it has rules. But within the corral, humans, both the regulator and the regulated, always need to have room to ask the question, how do we make sense of this? How do we make something work? It shouldn't be an instruction manual. It should be the opposite of an instruction manual. It should be something where people take responsibility and are accountable when they fail. Um, we need, going forward, sunset laws because they're kind of the, founders, the founders made a mistake. They didn't realize it would be 100 times harder to get rid of a law than to pass it. But as soon as a law is enacted, it's surrounded by an army of special interest. All of Washington is dedicated. All of that machinery is dedicated to the status quo. That's their job. Just have nothing change. So is any of this feasible? Anything, you know, why are we even talking about this? You know, the Congress can barely raise the debt ceiling to avoid a default on the national debt. So how, you know, why are we talking about these big ideas? Well, the answer is nothing's feasible. But what the political scientists say, it's precisely in these periods that pretty soon everything is going to be possible. Pressures build up over decades. This is the path of history. Change never happens with small ball. It always happens in big gulps. The change, the pressures build up, and then like the stick slip phenomenon of earthquakes, something happens. Some street vendor self-immolates in Tunisia, and it sets off some revolution, the Arab Spring in that case. So we're going to have, and in fact, we're overdue. This has happened in American history usually every 30 years. It happened in the 1960s. We changed our values, completely changed our legal, legal structure to address problems that we've been ignoring for years. Uh, it happened in the 1930s with social safety nets. It happened in the progressive era when we got rid of laissez-faire and finally started re regulating rapacious companies that were destroying children in their factories. It happened in the Civil War uh, in getting rid of slavery, but that followed decades of, of um, work by the abolitionists before Lincoln led the change. It happened with Jacksonian democracy. So we're going to, ha we're going to have change but change is not always good. It can happen like the Arab Spring or the French Revolution or something. So what I'm trying to do with this book is argue that we have a problem, we have problems not just of policy, when are we gonna deal with climate change, things like that. We have a problem of institutional design. We have a democracy that can't make choices, either at the smallest level, removing the tree from the creek, or at the biggest level, so balancing a budget and changing priorities. And we're not even having a debate about how to create the institutional design. Instead, reform groups, I believe, are canceling each other out. Climate change, budget hawks, all these people, they're just competing for airtime. When what's needed, and I have a piece coming out in the Washington Post this week that says this, what's needed is a master coalition of people concerned about the paralysis of our government, coming together, talking about this meta problem, which is how do we make choices again? And it's going to require a kind of decade-long spring cleaning uh, uh, to do this. The, um, you know, nothing, nothing in the history of the world has ever happened because somebody followed a rule. It's just nothing gets accomplished. Google didn't get accomplished because people followed rules. Nothing does. Nothing happens in your household because you follow a rule. People, things happen because people take responsibility to make them happen. Rules are really important in a free society to make people feel comfortable, provide a framework for common choices and such. But we can't create a legal system that's devoid of human hands, that avoids the possibility, indeed the inevitability of human error. And we have to have mechanisms to deal with that but we can never move forward until we have, until we can make new choices. Um, 
our government is not going anywhere. Washington's not going to fix it. It's broken. Every American knows it. And the only way it's going to get fixed, I believe, if Americans get together, leaders of business, leaders of not-for-profit citizens, get together and force the change on them. Because it's become anti-human, it's become disconnected from everyone. And whose fault is it? Nobody's. Thanks very much. Questions, if, if you all may have any. Yeah. So. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I, I think you're really making some excellent points, um, but it seems like you're fighting a lot of things. Every time there is a hurricane, the first thing the CNN cameras are asking is, "Well, why wasn't there a government law to prevent X, Y, and Z?" Uh, uh, we recently lost the uh, Malaysian airplane, and we're asking, well, why didn't we have X, Y, and Z communication? So it seems that our reaction in 24-hour news and a whole bunch of other things are fighting against this. That's one question I have. How do, and, and, but actually, I really have a, I, I mean, so if we want to get moving on this, how do we get moving? What are the steps? What's happened uh, previously in history? How do we crack through it? Because uh, I, I think you're, you're right on. This is causing all kinds of of problems from you know p people in their house being able to make reasonable choices with their family to all the way you know companies government uh, lots of different things. Um, the, the first question is you know how do we we have to change the narrative. I mean, there needs to be a new a new way. So one of the things I'm talking trying to talk to people about is a marketing plan. Literally a marketing plan. It's just like marketing anything else. You 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 have a plan to. That you have people who carry the message. They can be Jeb Bush endorsed my book, rousing endorsement last last week. Uh, Bill Bradley, I think, is going to endorse it. You get people from both parties to to begin to do it. You use that as a leader. Maybe we can get some movie stars, you know. And then you start sending out direct mail or the Google equivalent of direct mail, and and start selling this uh, the, the idea that we need fundamental change, that we need to get together to force Washington to act. So it's a it's, uh, you know, I think what's, what, you know, the hardest thing in history is when a society gets to be too rich and people think that Washington's, the government's over there, I have a nice life, you know, and it will, somebody else will solve the problem. That isn't happening. So it's, you know, I think there, there does have to be, the Tea Party, in a sense, is kind of constructive. I mean, they have the wrong solutions. They're right, the government's broken. Yeah. Um, but there is a, that sense, that kind of populist sense that we need to come together to make it work again is essential. We just need to have a better idea about how to, how to fix it and restore responsibility rather than, in their case, just blow it up and do away with the government. Right. I, and, and I guess the, the examples that you gave in the beginning uh, are illustrative of that, and it's a way that we can actually use media and other things to turn this problem around. Whenever there's a case of someone drowning because of some regulation, this should be what's on the news rather than making more laws about other things. Oh yeah, and so, so just on that point, every time there's a crisis, there will be a natural instinct to say, why isn't there a law? Yeah. And they'll pass a law. And often that's very hard to overcome. You know, it's just overwhelming, it's, you know, that's just gonna be the first reaction of any any legislator. So, so what's needed more than getting rid of that, which is probably hard to do in all cases, is a year later the process by which you then take away the law and you say, you know, it's not working or it's counterproductive. And that's, and we don't have, again, we don't have that discussion. Yes. So you mentioned earlier that you know, tech is just now starting to feel the pain um, so one example was, as you know, we sent five, Google sent five people to go help fix the healthcare.gov website. And I think, feel like anyone who's ever worked with government contracts know that there's this huge pile of paperwork that lets the government decide how to pick contracts, right? right. And it's very bloated and they have, I think like healthcare.gov had 20 different vendors that were hired just to build one website. 
have you done any res or any work with that space as far as reform or less rules on you know who the government can hire to build something like a website that's been done multiple times in the Bay Area, right? right. It's uh, um, the, they're called procurement laws, and I was an advisor to Al Gore and Bill Clinton in redoing the procurement laws in the reinventing government uh, campaign of 20 years ago. So I worked very closely. I gave speeches, wrote introductions of books by Al Gore and stuff like that. Um, uh, and they made a few improvements, including, for example, not having to go through those idiotic processes when you want to go buy a pad of paper. But they didn't, uh, so they gave public employees credit cards and things that you go buy office supplies, which is a minor reform, but believe it or not, that was a reform. Um, but they haven't fixed it for big procurement, things like, you know, you know health care and such. Um, the government spends, I forget the number, it's, it's, in the, it's over $500 billion a year in outside government contracts. Uh, best estimates are they waste between 30 and 40 percent of it through these procedures that basically try to prescribe in advance how the project, so they literally specify in advance how you're going to create the website instead of letting smart engineers get in a room and work through and adapt to all the problems. It's, it's a form of it's a form of mental illness to think that you could actually accomplish anything by writing it in advance and then saying, just go do it. I happened to be on the plane last night out here with the head of a division of Boeing. And we were discussing the problems of, of procurement and why it's so hard to get good products at a good price through this process. I have another friend, a high school classmate, who's the deputy head of procurement at the Department of Defense. He gives speeches to hundreds of procurement officials saying, please use your judgment, please be flexible. But you have this whole culture of nobody using their judgment. It, that area truly needs to get replaced. It needs to get replaced by a system where you identify an official, the group underneath him, who is in charge of letting the contract, and because no one's going to trust him, you maybe have an industry committee of people seconded from different industries who have the authority to review and reverse contracts, something like that. And it would happen in a third the time and save all that money. It's broken. There's not one government <coughs> program that isn't broken. Let's, let's go there. Every pro government program, the question is whether it's broken 25% or 95%. That one's broken about 65%. <laughs> yes. um, you know, for every rule I think that's out there, if there isn't sort of a vested minority interest that's keeping it alive, even though it should be extinct, there might have been sort of a transgression at some point. So to your example where, you know, in the nursing homes you have to cook the eggs or the food has to be above 35 inches, I imagine at some point someone did something wrong and it turned into a lawsuit. Sure. So I'm wondering to what extent, you know, there has to be tort reform or the law needs to change so that it, you know, it's not so, you know, such a lawyer sue happy culture. And so yeah, we have that's to really, a really important point. People, uh, there's a general instinct by people to avoid responsibility. In general. So if they have an excuse to avoid responsibility, they will. It's like play, people in Plato's cave. Just let us, you know, as long as you feed us, we're happy to be down in the cave. Um, uh, the fear of litigation, what the fire chief in Alameda County said is I can't, one of the other things he said was, I can't go in the ocean, there might be liability. <laughs> liability to whom? For saving a life? I mean, you, know, you think about it for one nanosecond, and you think, well, that's like the dumbest thing you've ever heard. But, but he said it. Um, so there is this kind of abstract fear, which I have written a lot about. I mean, you know, the problem with the, the system of civil justice in this country isn't that juries are so stupid or whatever is that now it kind of waves of defensiveness have overcome all of society. Teachers will no longer put an arm around a crying child. My law firm has a rule, as every business does, I bet Google does too, that you're not allowed to give a job reference. That's so stupid. This is the land of the First Amendment. You're not allowed to give a job reference because scared you might get sued if you, if you say some qualifying fact about, that's honest about an employee. So yes, we do, and I talk about this in, in, in the book. I mean, so one of the, one of the, uh, I, at the end of the book, I have a bill of responsibilities. 
that basically clarifies responsibilities of different groups of different uh, branches of government. And with courts, I say that basically no lawsuit should be allowed to go forward until a judge has made a legal ruling about whether the claims should be allowed to go forward and won't undermine the freedoms of other people in the society. Because now we have this kind of laissez-faire attitude of justice that, well, you've got a right to sue, right? People say that. Suing is not an act of freedom. Suing is an act of state power. Sue somebody, you, you win, you take away their home. The sheriff comes and takes away their home. You know, we have it, again, it's like another one of these things where we've inverted the role of law. So the whole point of lawsuits is that they're lawsuits, not like sue for anything suits, right? So, you know, so yeah, it's a really important, it's a really important reform to go along with all this. All right, well, you're first. Hi, thanks a lot for your talk. I'm wondering how much of this problem is a result of the violation of the principle of subsidiarity, where decisions and things ought to be made at the lowest possible level, and the higher levels, like the federal government is getting involved in things that the states ought to be handling, and the states are getting involved in things that the local government ought to be handling. Really important question. So there's this doctrine that originated, I think, in the Catholic Church, that responsibility should be pushed down to the lowest possible level so that people on the ground own their choices, their own, in a sense, they own their community, they own their schools and such, rather than having top-down bureaucracies and rules, rules for the ultimate centralization, you know, where, in this case, dead people telling you what to do because they wrote a rule 30 years ago or something. Um, uh, and I talk about subsidiarity in the book. Uh, so one of the solutions here, while you're doing the spring cleaning, is to, to the greatest extent possible, push down decisions to a local level. That doesn't mean you give up oversight. It doesn't mean people can do whatever they want and teach creationism or whatever people you know, will fear they're going to do. But the, but the regulations should be much lighter. You know, right now you have regulation, the, the rule of law. You know, this big iron claw comes down into everybody's you know, lives in their schools and in their communities. You need to lift up that big iron claw. Let people do their own ways and only get involved if, you know, if people really leave the reservation, you know, they really leave the corral. Again, a really important point because Americans no longer feel they own their communities. And there are a lot of studies of this. And the truth is they don't. You know, if you want, if you're a retired physicist or retired software engineer and, and you want to go work in the schools, you can. You're, you're much better qualified than anybody in the school. But you're not certified to be a teacher, sorry. You know, if you want to go help in a hospice, you can. Are you certified? You know, it, it, all these bureaucratic constraints prevent real people who are qualified from getting involved. Here. Wait, 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 one more from the cameraman. Um, well, I, I just paid him to ask this question. <laughs> well, I actually was an educator, and when you talked about education, I was a special education teacher, and we got a significant part of the budget. But the other thing that I seem to find is is that more and more students were then identified as as being special needs students, and it seemed like there was a significant portion of the community that felt served by what some of us thought was a broken system. So how do, how do you address the people that feel served even though it's broken? Uh, you have to make common choices. I mean, special ed, uh, according to some studies I've seen, seen, has twice the number of people in it ought to have in it. It becomes a place where you get special training, you get more time to take your tests. You, there are all kinds of advantages to being designated in, 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 in the special ed. Um, you can't run a democracy by the lowest common denominator. Uh, you can't. Um, you can't have environmental reviews that last 10 years. <coughs> Germany, much greener country, they last one, two years at the most. Because they, they have a decision maker who says, OK, we've let everybody say, now we're going to, this, this official has a responsibility to make a decision, and that can be appealed to that official, and that's it. Um, and the budget in schools is a limited 
amount of dollars. You know, I think we need, in inner cities, the experts I've talked to think we need a dramatic redirection, not to pre-K education, but to prenatal education. I mean, you know, really getting these kids and their mothers before they're born so they can develop the language skills and all the things that happen in the first couple of years. Um, that's expensive. Well, where's that money going to come from? So, so we have to make these choices in our society. And, and if it's all preset and legal concrete, we can't make the choice. Uh, one more question. And so uh, I think served is one aspect that people feel served by the laws. But I think also there's an aspect of people being scared by change. So the more we talk about this, like you just mentioned the physicists. So you excited all the physicists in, in the room. Uh, but you just scared millions of teachers because they are comfortable with the current law. When you talk about balancing the budget and you talk about the three big programs, well, oh, okay, so Social Security, Medicare, you just scared a whole nother group of people. And we could go on and on. The more we talk about this, basically everyone in this room is going to be scared. Well, maybe not. Uh, you, w the percentage of people that are going to be scared is, is already about 50% just based on the current conversation. No, probably more. I, it's, a, it's an excellent question. First of all, change is scary. Again, we go back to Plato's cave. They didn't want to go out in the light. They wanted to stay shackled. It's much safer to just you know, be where they are. So it's like an evolutionary imperative. We have food in our stomachs. People will never go out to risk the world of saber-toothed tigers you know, and converging technology companies. They'll just stay in their cave. So, um, so change is scary. But the status quo is also scary. And so one of the many things that's missing in our current uh, dialogue about, what, about our society are people who have moral authority. So what's really important is for people to stand up and say, not I'm going to get rid of special ed the way it is, but to say, we're going to remake a whole bunch of things. And you're going to be better off on balance. But everybody's going to have to sacrifice. Because this huge bureaucratic blob, we're all feeding off of it. So we're scared to lose the feeding off of this big bureaucratic blob, but it's also suffocating us, and it's not sustainable because we can't afford it. We're running half trillion to trillion dollar deficits every year. We can't address climate change. I mean, we, you know, we can't address immigration, bad immigration law. We can't address anything. So how do you do that? Well, you need a group that isn't vindictive and says, I'm going to get you, which is sort of what both groups are now. You need people with moral authority, who people trust, to be saying what they really believe. You know, they don't have to agree with them. And I challenge you to find any public leader, or even any public citizen, maybe you can find a couple, Al Simpson, who have moral authority. Because the way we've organized our dealings with government, even environmental groups, look like special interests. You know, they just want to do that. They don't want to fix all the other things, too. They don't, you know, so, so, so we need to pull back. I mean, this, this, is, uh, this is a dawning problem. Uh, and uh, there's a wonderful anarchist called Peter Kropotkin who wrote 100 years ago. He, was a, he fled, he was a white Russian, fled the revolution. Uh, got a job writing for the Encyclopedia Britannica. If it were now, he would be working for Google for sure. Uh, you know, was a brilliant guy. Um, wrote these hysterical tracks. And he said, uh, the more miserable a man is, the more he fears change, lest it make him more miserable still. <laughs> and so we do have to fight human nature in doing this. Everything I'm saying requires fighting human nature. That doesn't mean it isn't right. It just means we've got to deal with it. Thank you.